Well, hello, 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 hello today. I believe it is a very good morning and you're enjoying yourself and you have decided to join me this morning uh, for this thought that we're uh, and subject matter that we're discussing. Uh, something we're going to be, I uh, uh, forgot to get that welcome off the screen. Uh, we're going to uh, be discussing something to consider part three something to consider part three that is our subject matter today now since i put the slide presentation together on this something to consider i've even grown in revelation uh, by the leading of the spirit of god the holy spirit speaking to me and the message that he is really solidifying into my spirit for this time that we're going through and uh, opening up a thought and a revelation of christ and his ministry here in Jesus, while Jesus of Nazareth walked the earth, Christ manifested himself, in, which is the incarnate word, into Christ of Nazareth. And Jesus Christ is our example. Uh, Jesus' last name is not Christ, it's, he's Jesus from Nazareth. And that's his origin as far as his earthly origin and Christ is the Spirit of God, the Son of God, manifest in and through Jesus of Nazareth's life. So I consider myself to be a Christ follower. And you will notice that um, in the slide presentation that we will uh, give you today, I use that word Christ follower. I do this, on, I do this intentionally because uh, as Christ followers, we embrace the ideology that all of humanity belongs to God. All of humanity comes from God. God is the originator of every person, every personality. Every spirit that comes on this earth came from God. It doesn't matter what nation you're born in, you're not, uh, uh, what, what, what we consider nationality, or what tongue you speak, we all come from God. Now there's a, a journey back to God that we all have to take. And I believe that this message is, is and I use this word, um, um, well, I don't know the word candidly. I use this word advisedly, uh, the word universal. The message that we have is universal or global. It's maybe more friendly to your ears. More, It's a global message for everyone. Not particular for a particular set or certain group. It's for all the children of God to hear. Because in all the children of God, God has placed his spirit. We all come from God. We're all spiritual. And we all have the voice of God in us. We have to train ourselves to hear God's voice. And the competition, the voice that is warring against or trying to veil us from God's voice is our voice, which I refer to and most psychologists refer to as our ego. See, our ego is the voice that is attached to our senses, to our body, to our experience, uh, to our earth consciousness and our identity or our concept, our concept of ourselves here on this planet. But anyway, I think, I believe this message is extremely important because this brings us back to the consciousness of God. And when we remember our Father, we will also, all of us will find our way back to our Father and we find the bliss and the joy that is intended for us to have while we are cohabiting on earth. As while we are on earth and it's in this, um, in this earth realm, we are supposed to experience the happiness and the joy of God. There should be peace that's ruling us and moving us forward toward God likeness. And that's one of the things that we have to learn. We have to discover ourselves as being sons of God there's really only one son, which is the Christ, but at least we need to move in that direction by accepting our sonship and then accepting that we are brothers, okay? In spirit, we have, we have God as our father. We are brothers in spirit. There's not a diversity of God. There's no plurality of God. There's just one God. Our Lord God is one, and we have to embrace uh, that reality. So what are we going to do now? We're going to give you on this screen, as you've seen now, mm -hmm. uh, from our screen, we are uh, <clears throat> looking at <clears throat> this first slide. Now, I, I've changed the slides, as I said, since I began, and I, I, because it was becoming 
um, the slides and the presentation seem to me uh, to uh, be uh, rather um, defensive or, or rather uh, a, a kind of attacked. It kind of had a separatist sound to it, which I didn't mean. So I changed some of the words of the slides. Uh, so this, uh, from this point on, we can see that God is not divided and we are not divided in our belief system. We are one as God is one. Now, synchronism is the attempt to fuse different belief systems that don't naturally go together, beliefs that are often diametrically opposed to each other. But truth will not synchronize. Truth, if one will admit to it, uh, its reality is a bit like turning on the light in the middle of the night. It has a stark, unsettling quality to it. Yes, Jesus claims the truth will set you free, but that's a bit like your doctor saying, you'll feel better if you had some major surgery on your body. That may be true, but chances are you would avoid an invasive surgery like that unless you believe there was no other way. Truth is just as invasive. It's unsettling. The writer of Hebrews said, Truth is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitude of the heart. This is why embracing something and calling it truth makes you a hero to some and an enemy to others. In an in an attempt to blend the truth claims of world religions, some purpose we should adopt, I propose we should adopt the notion that each religion only has a piece of a large shared truth. Like the ancient fable of the six blind men who examine the elephant. The moral of the story is clear. We may talk foolishly about what we think and about what we believe, and it may sound as if we are telling very different stories, but in the end, believing is the work of the blind. Hence, we may all be right. Believing is the work of the blind, so we may all be right. Now, one of the things that you're going to notice in this teaching, we want to graduate. We start off believing in God, but we want to graduate from believing in God to knowing God. Because once there is knowledge, there is no need for belief. Believing in God makes room for unbelief. But knowing God has no room for unbelief, just like knowing truth has no variations to it. Truth is definitive, is directive. There's no shallow turning in truth. There's no debating truth. And there's no opposite to truth because God is truth. Just like God is love and there's no opposites to God. So when we enter into truth, there's no opposites. When we know God, there's no opposite. So there's no need to believe. As long as I'm believing God or believing in God, there's room and a possibility for me not to believe in God. But once I know God, there's no way you can talk me out of what I know. It's not a belief system anymore that I'm living by. It's a knowing, it's a relationship. And that's what we're working toward. And that's why I believe this type of teaching is vital for those of you who are listening. We want you to know God. Now, this, this story, uh, a very, very stimulating philosoph philosophical idea but here's the problem with uh, that idea. The Christ follower's story doesn't fit into that parable. Not only would those who follow Christ hold that Christ is not like Buddha or Muhammad, who would be seen in the elephant parable as one of the blind men describing God, who is represented by the elephant, but we hold that Christ is the elephant. Jesus said to his disciples, how can you say, show us the Father? Then he claimed, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. 
Christ is not the blind prophet teaching about God. Christ is God incarnate. Scripture claims the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Now, this is important. Now, Christ comes in, he reveals himself in Jesus of Nazareth, and Christ is the incarnate of God, or the incarnation of God. Now, I want you to understand this. This is, this is something that may knock you off your seat or off your stool. God is incarnate in each and every one of us. Christ in you is God incarnate in you. So Christ in you is God in you. I want you to follow that. That's God in you. And God finds his home in you. So if God is in you, then God is not separate from you. And if you are, you now the Holy Spirit, who, who is the voice for God, speaks to you, he will always lead you to this, tr this truth that all your need is not outside of you, or the meeting of all your need is not outside of you. The meeting of all your need and the fulfillment of all your need is from within you where God is. So the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, will draw your attention to your inner, okay, your inner self, your inner relationship with God. Now this word, this message is designed to build um, a, an awareness of the presence of God that's within you to the point that you will always be aware of his presence to the point that you understand with him being in me then I'm one with God. I'm one with the mind of Christ. I don't have to look outside of me for help because I have all my answers within me. This is the reason for these types of lessons. Uh, this is the reason for this type of message. And there is a formula that we're going to talk about a little later on in our presentation on how we all arrive there by having the same mind, okay? And we have a mind and, and, uh, a, and oh, I don't like the word judgment. We have a mind and a direction and a course that is directed by our loving Father who's leading us home. He's leading us out of this delusion or illusion or are, are this falsity of reality, this reality, we, we, this place that we call real, that is com, com, uh, completely adverse to the life of God, to the love of God, to the joy of God. God lives by the law of life. This system that we're in lives by the law of death and sin and destruction and war and debate, anything that has, and decay, anything that deals with death, this is what what drives this system, but we are in this system, but we have in us the law of life that sets off this system from working with us, and the law of life in us actually preserves us in this system as lights in this system, and we are not overcome by this system. We are overcomers in this system, and this simply says it's not that you won't be attacked by this system through your body. But in your spirit, there's the force of life that will set off the attacks that come against you through your body. From your spirit, you're answered by the law of life because you and your father are one. Just like Jesus said, me and my father are one. Just like Jesus said to his disciples who asked him to show them the father. He said, you asked me that? Have you been with me so long that you don't know me? To know me is to know the Father because the Father and I are one. The same thing is true with you. To know you is to know the Father because you're walking as he leads you. You're following the, the voice of the Holy Spirit. There's no fear in you, which we'll talk about a little bit later on in this presentation. And, if, and we'll talk about how to cast that off. God is alive in you. To see you is to see the Father. And when people see Christ in you, they discover and they remember the face of God, which make them, which will help them remember themselves and their relationship with God. Because you're that light being turned on in that dark room. So, 
Then he claimed, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is not the blind prophet teaching about God. Christ is God incarnate. Scripture claims the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. The true or the true claim concerning Christ is far too unique to fit in with any other belief system. So different is the Christ followers message that the very followers of Jesus were referred to as atheists because their story could not fit with any other religious story being told in the ancient world. N.T. Wright wrote in one of his books, because he was a chaplain at a, at, a, at, a, at a school, he wrote in one of his books that when someone would say to him, because he would talk to all, as a chaplain, he would speak to all the students that would come into the school. And when someone would say to him, I don't believe in God, he would ask, what God don't you believe in? They would answer, a being who lived up in the sky looking down disappoint, disapprovingly at the world occasionally intervening to do miracles, sending bad people to hell while allowing good people to share his heaven. Wright would respond to this spy in the sky theology. Well, I'm not surprised you don't believe in that God. I don't believe in that God either. He would say, I believe in the God I see revealed in Jesus of Nazareth. The Christ follower doesn't just believe in spirituality or in any description of God. The Christ follower believes specifically in the God who is revealed in Jesus Christ. He is not just one powerful being who uh, objectifies forces and drives uh, the world nor is the Christ follower's God, the God of the ancient Greeks, Zeus, Hermes, and so on, who is far away and only engages in the affairs of men and beasts when he is angry or after some selfish end. The God revealed in Jesus Christ is personal, the creator of all that exists, and he is one who longs to care for the human race and for his creation. The Christ follower's God is both another than the world and savior of his creations. He is all that is. This is a very different picture from how all other religions portray their gods. After careful analysis, the Christ follower is declaring that Jesus Christ is the truest reflection of the one true God. In the same breath and at great risk, we are saying that the gods of other religions are not gods at all. They are idols. And that is the problem with the Christ follower's truth. It is too exclusive to let anything fit. Jesus warns us the world will love you if you belong to it, but you don't. I chose you to come out of the world, and so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A servant is not greater than the master, since they persecuted me, naturally they will persecute you. And that's John 15, 19 uh, through 20. I have, a, a, you know, I had my discussion, my usually weekly meeting with my friend, and we were talking about this. And we were talking about how our gospel fits into the world of people who have not yet arrived to that truth. And I was talking about, well, you know, people, we still, because we use the word illusion and delusion a lot in our message, I said, but we got to always uh, respect a person's illusion and make because that illusion, our, our delusion, is their reality. And they're not, you know, so you got to ease them into the light gradually. Because when they are made ready by the Spirit of God, we the teachers will lead them into the light and the marvelous light. So we got to gradually work this truth into their thought processes. So we may have, you may be one of those that have to gradually embrace this. So what would I say that this is saying to us? Especially when it says, Jesus warns us the world, uh, would, uh, the world would love you if you belong to it, but you don't. 
This means that this world's system, there's a, a subconscious, a part of you that you don't even know, but is, is also a part of the concept of yourself that the ego knows about, but your consciousness is not aware of, which has some guilt, which feels because of your choice to separate yourself from God, come into this system that is completely separate from the love of God, completely separate from God's eternal purpose and law of life, but now separate by working the law of death in this whole system, plants, fish, birds, everything die in this system because it's separate from the love of God and it's not inter eternal, it's temporary. This world system, not the earth, not the beast or the, or the people on it, but the world system that is controlling the life on this earth, this world will come against you because you're trying to wake up the children in the creation of God to let them understand that no, you're not separate from God. You are not guilty. You're not a sinner, but you are the child of God. You have been forgiven by your heavenly father. He is not holding anything against you, but he's here to work your salvation, work in your salvation so that you can work out that salvation in your everyday existence. Well, this system is going to come against you. It's going to attack you socially and physically and even financially because it's trying to drown out, choke out the truth that's in you. But like an artesian well inside of you, it cannot be drowned out. It just bubbles up because of your relation with your father who is in you and it flows out of you and gives life to all that you influence and touch. This is most powerful and this power works in you and is given to you as a gift. You don't have to earn it. God has given it to you because he wants you to have it and all his power is, has, it has been given to you and the Holy Spirit is teaching you how to work his power in this system to debunk the voice of the ego, all right? To dethrone the voice of the ego from trying, trying to lead and keep you from your true identity. So that's what I believe the scripture means, the world, not people. It, um, the system will work through people, but the folks who are in love with this world, in love with being uh, separate from God, and, feel, and, and that love is driven by guilt and fear of God, will come against you because you become fearful to him, them. You become a threat to them by telling them the truth. So we have to find a very wise, divine way to gently lead people from their darkness into truth. You don't force your will or your way on them. You lovingly, you know, just draw them into the truth. So sweet, so smooth, that once they arrive, they'll be thanking you and not hating you. The Spirit of God gives us that kind of wisdom. So, I believe that following Christ is following truth. But, that doesn't mean I think it's okay for any of us to embrace an us against them dialect. I don't believe that that's the case. Now here, we're going to take, we only got a few minutes, so we're going to get started on this, and hopefully we'll pick this up next week. The message that we should be embracing is the message that Christ has and is still ministering through us as he enlightens us and awakens us to the message by way of the Holy Spirit. And this message is love and forgiveness by healing the mind, or what the, the King James Version says, by renewing the mind. Now we're going to talk about the purpose, the process, and the practice of renewing the mind. Again, uh, I talk about the Course of Miracles. Uh, <clears throat> we have drawn a lot from the Course of Miracles. And we're going to continually draw from uh, the Course of Miracles. And so uh, when we go through the slide presentations, you're going to find uh, some words that we may interchange with Renewing the Mind. We might talk about psychotherapy. Now, psychotherapy sounds like a clinical word, but it's not, not, not the way that we're going to use it. Technically, all of us who are enlightened, as you even listening to me, you are listening, getting information so that you yourself will be a, ther a therapist. And psychotherapy is, the, is, is what the course is, is the only therapy 
that really is existent in this world because it all has to do with healing and renewing the mind because the mind tells the body what to view. You know, one, one statement came, it says, the eyes, the physical eyes don't see. It just, re it, 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 it is, uh, it detects. It detects what the brain says that it should detect. It doesn't have its own sight. Because when you have spiritual sight, you see things differently than physical sight. And that's really true sight. You see things as directed by the Spirit of God. And so the brain tells your body uh, that it's in pain. The brain tells your body that it feels good. The brain tells your body that it feels enthusiastic. The brain tells your body to, to have, to, that it's happy. But the body has no brain. It's, it's told what to do. So whatever the body is going through, the brain will tell the body to be sick. And it works that through guilt and fear. It tells the body that it's well and healthy. So if you have your mind healed and well, you're going to have your body follow suit that follows your mind. The last example is a limb that's been cut off. You cut that limb off, your brain will tell you that limb is still there and that it hurts. And, and when you look, that limb has been removed. So you felt something that's not even there. That's the closest uh, example that I have to show you the power of the brain. So we renew the brain to have it agree with God and listen to the Holy Spirit. You will find that many of our ailments, many of our problems, many of the, the experiences that we have will be changed because we will see the concept of ourselves differently. The concept that we have about others, we'll see it differently. The concept that we have about the world, we'll see it differently. And our expectations will draw in by the power that's in us, the blessings of God in our lives. Well, we have come to the end of our broadcast. And so I just want you uh, to, to remember the subject matter today is something to consider part three. I also want you to uh, go to our web uh, page is right here www.nccfc.net. Uh, that's our webpage. That's the church's webpage, the New Creation Christian Faith Center's webpage. I want to thank you um, for those of you who give. Now, what's, what's happening here, it, the miraculous is happening. God is giving me understanding and revelation to teach. And when you take the words, which is the, the Holy Spirit using my voice, based on your understanding, because though I may purpose something, a thought for you to have when I deliver this message, the Holy Spirit will deliver the message in a way that it will feed you with my purpose are completely different than what I purposed for you to hear. But what you hear is a spiritual revelation and feeding and strengthening of your life. So a miracle happens when you hear the word of God. So such as I have... I give. Now, you, know, you can only give what you have. And so a miracle goes from me to you because I give you the revelation, the thought that God gave me now is yours. You don't have to seek it. You don't have to pray for it. It comes to you free. But when you give an offering, a tithe, and a gift, then you're giving what you have. And now your miracle of financial gift it is a miracle that totally abolishes any lack in our lives. It, it supplies our need and gives us financial strength to keep bringing uh, this word to you, financial strength to keep living. So you're sharing. I share what God shares with me with you. You share what God has given you with me. And so a relationship is formed. There is no cost to this. There's no cost to this at all. I'm not charging for anything because you don't charge in a relationship. It's called free. It's, it's what God, see, I don't think of, you need to pay for this. This is freely given to me, so I freely give. So when God blesses you, you will continually be the source that God uses to take care of the ministers. And this is me and my family that's doing his work. You partner with what God is doing, but you never charge. So it has to be free. It has to be done joyously. It has to be done by the inspiration of the Spirit. Whatever God sets in your heart to give, you do that. And I thank God for you. You have listened to the voice of God and you are giving according to what God has suggested in your heart. You're doing cheerfully and it's always timely and it's always a miracle. But the miracle is not one way. 
Because as you bless others, you bless yourself. As I give revelation to you, I also give revelation to myself. As I am your teacher, I become the student as well. And so it's a two-way exchange. You give and receive at the same time. So I want to thank you again. Uh, we will put that up there. NCCFC.net. That's our web page. There is a, um, a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There is a PayPal tab there. And you can give a love offering. You can give a tie. You can just give a, a, a friendship offering. You can, just give, you can just be a supporter of the ministry. Because you decided to give a certain amount of money to the ministry every week. Thank you. At the end of the year, we give contribution statements so that you can have a record of your gift. If you choose to take that contribution statement, you can also apply it to your taxes for a credit because the government is still giving credit for those who give to nonprofits. You can use it that way. Now, um, I have a personal face Facebook page. That's my Facebook page address. You can go there. And uh, you can um, um, drop me a line or s watch my family grow because I, I post pictures of my, um, of my grandchildren on that page. And, you know, just be a part of what we're doing. We also put up some of our videos on that page from our Talk, talk Fusion the video emails that show up on that page as well. And sometimes there is a Facebook Live that is posted on that page from our Sunday morning services. So you go to that page, my personal page, and befriend me and follow me, and I'll follow you from that Facebook page. And then um, you're here today on YouTube, and you should know about this YouTube address. I put it, this up just in case you're watching this program with someone else, and so you would know what the address is. It's Will Wheat 3, YouTube backslash Will Wheat 3. Go to the page, okay? Click on a video that, that is showing. It could be even a replay of this video. Like the video and hit subscription. We hit subscription, that little bell will come up. Hit that bell twice. Now, what's, what is that for, Apostle? That's so that you can be notified every time we go live. Sometimes I go live on Wednesday night, like we're going live on Saturday mornings. I may have a special message for everybody and just go live during the week and, and put that message up. And so you can say, oh, boom, Apostle Week is going live on Monday. Apostle Week is going live uh, on uh, Tuesday at such such a time. He has a special message for you. So then you can catch that message live as is given to you by tuning into our channel. But if you miss it, it's also recorded. You can always go back and uh, view it at a more convenient time for yourself. So make sure you go to it and you hit subscribe. And I thank you, thank you, thank you for taking these videos and sharing them with your family and your friends. Thank you for doing that. That really helps us when you share this video with your family and friends. Well, that uh, concludes it for me today. That's all that we have. I thank God for you. I know this Saturday is a blessed day. It's beautiful outside. I know you're gonna enjoy yourself. I know that you're going to be safe and you're going to enjoy your family. If you decide, we're going to put up at the end of this program our address for Sunday morning, tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. Uh, we're going to be meeting in Inglewood. I'm going to have that address up. If you have never worshipped with us, if you've never been to one of our worship services, it will bless your life to come to our worship service. Um, I know it's early, but think of it this way. You get up early, you come you start your day out by hearing the word of God, fellowshipping with like um, uh, believers and Christ followers. You have the whole rest of the Sunday to just enjoy it and be blessed and even talk about how good God was or the message for that day. Now, the address is 315 South Market Street. And I'm letting people know this is, a, uh, this is not our home. This is, we, we, we were renting a room and we needed a facility that would be safe for children when parents brought their children and for nursery uh, age children, and then give them an opportunity to come into the worship service. And we found a place for a very reasonable price that gave us all that we needed. And at this address, at 315 South Market Street, we have all of that. Now it happens to be, we happen to be meeting in the Church of Scientology. Now we are not Church of Scientologists, that we are Christ 
followers. It's a building. It's a room. There's nothing negative is going to happen to you because you're coming into a building that's supposed to be non-Christian. You are the church not a building. And that's what I teach. You're the church. You're the God's ecclesia. And wherever you go, the anointing of God goes with you. So don't be afraid of a building or the name on the building. Come for the richness that God has for your life. Now, um, we have temporary meeting there. We're going to save finances. If people come and people give, we're saving. We have a, we have a plan, a, a, a savings plan that we're going to work it and find our own location, okay, where we don't have to share, we don't have to, uh, we don't want to, and we'll be in a building. But until that time, we need you to come. We need you to support us physically and financially to help us realize our dream and our goal, okay? And you do that, and you will be blessed. I promise you, you will be blessed. And that's all I have to say about that. I just want you to know where we are. No secrets. I'm not trying to slip you into something there's a lot of stuff there that I'm telling you not to get involved with if you don't want to, but I'm telling you that the word of God there is rich. And I want you to come and receive from God's word tomorrow morning. Okay, I'm going to put the address up in just a second when I close. It's uh, 315 North Market Street, 8 a.m. Until tomorrow morning or to the next time we see each other via video, via YouTube or Facebook, remember... God has plans for your life, and none of those plans include defeat. See you.